Good morning. So without wasting any time, I invite the first speaker, Dr. Manoj Kumar B. Gadikari, on the dais. His paper is, is sarcopenia a hype or does it really affect the outcome of spine surgeries? Dr. Gadikari. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, eight minutes plus two. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Manoj Kumar Gadikeri. Before we dive into the topic, let us begin with a case scenario where two patients in their mid-60s present to us with this X-ray. They undergo a similar procedure, and we see that one patient is happy and gets discharged early, while the other patient ends up with wincing in pain, delayed mobilization, prolonged hospital stay, and ends up getting discharged late. I'm pretty sure most of us must have experienced such instances in our day-to-day -day practice. And after seeing this, we start to wonder why this happens. The answer could be sarcopenia. So we came up with a study to find out, is sarcopenia a hype or does it really affect the outcome of spine surgeries? It was as late as 1980s when we first came to know of sarcopenia when the term was coined by Sir Erwin Rosenberg. It basically means loss of skeletal muscle mass leading to impaired muscle function. Sarcopenia has n number of causative factors, with most common and important ones being old age, lack of physical activity, impaired nutrition, and hormonal causes. With a prevalence of more than 50% seen in uh, above 80, 60 years of age, it's a cause of great concern, as sarcopenia is a known and an important risk factor for repeated falls, fractures, disability, prolonged hospitalization, and bad post-op outcomes. An initiative by the name European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People, they first met in 2010 and they defined sarcopenia based on muscle mass. It was as late as 2018 when they realized that muscle strength has more important role than muscle mass and they redefined sarcopenia as muscle disease and it was included in the ICD-10 for the first time. The group gave a criteria where if only low muscle strength was present, then it was called as a probable sarcopenia. Along with that, if there was low muscle quality or quantity, then that would confirm the diagnosis of sarcopenia. And along with the ABO2, if there was low physical performance, then that would define as a severe sarcopenia. Here are a few tests which are advised by European Working Group to assess the ABO parameters, where skeletal muscle strength can be assessed using handheld dynamometer and 30 second chair stand test. Skeletal muscle quality and quantity can be analyzed using MRI or CT scan, bioelectric impedance analysis and DEXA scan. Physical performance can be assessed using gait speed, short physical performance battery, and timed up and go test. The objective of our study was to prospectively evaluate for any correlation between sarcopenia and surgical outcome in patients who are being operated for lumbar spine pathology, for which we chose a prospective study design consisting of 114 patients who were categorized into five groups based on their age, and they were followed up for a duration of at least three months from the date of surgery. The outcome was measured using grip strength, which was analyzed using a standard handheld dynamometer, and the values were compared with the cutoff values of standard Indian population. Similar thing was done with the 30 second chair stand test as well. SOAS muscle index was calculated on preoperative MRI at the level of L3 pedicle, and it was normalized to the height of the patient, and the values were compared with the cutoff values of Indian population. ODI scores were calculated preoperatively at two weeks and three months postoperatively. A difference of at least 12.8% was needed to be called as a clinically important difference. Any perioperative complications were noted and they were graded based on dindoclavin classification. Time to mobilization was classified as early ambulators when the patient mobilized, was mobilized within 24 hours of surgery, as intermediate when mobilized between 24 to 72 hours, and delayed ambulators when they were mobilized beyond 72 hours of surgery. Length of hospital stay was considered as optimal when it was between zero to three days, delayed when it was between four to seven days, and extended when it was beyond seven days. The most widely used being the hamstrings and the bone patella tendon bone graft. The hamstrings, when used, you are sacrificing a pro-ACL muscle. They also have the complication of an unpredictable graft size, and some patients experience thigh wasting post-operatively. Bone patella tendon bone has the disadvantage of anterior knee pain post-harvest, a fixed length, and runs the risk of patella fractures. Bearing in mind these disadvantages, we decided to take up this study to assess the functional outcome of anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction using peroneus longus tendon, to study the strength of foot eversion and first ray plantar flexion, and to study donor site morbidity. 
It was a prospective observational study over a period of two years, including 40 cases, followed up for a minimum of one year post-op. My surgical technique entailed a two to three centimeter skin incision, uh, posterior to the lateral malleolus. The peroneal sheath was incised. As you can see in the image over here, the peroneus longus and brevis tendon were identified. The peroneus longus tendon was then tenodest to the peroneus brevis tendon, and then the peroneus longus tendon was harvested proximal to this tenodesis site. Arthroscopic ACL reconstruction was carried out according to standard technique. Each patient was evaluated for functional outcome using the Lisholm knee score. Thigh wasting was assessed by measuring the thigh circumference and comparing with the unoperated leg. Donor site morbidity was assessed using ankle hind foot score. Foot eversion and first ray plantar flexion strength were assessed by the MRC grading of power and by the use of therabands. And complications, if any, were noted. The results of my studies were as follows. The mean age was 29.7 years, with majority of the patients being male and only one patient being female. Most of my patient population was active individuals, some non-professional athletes playing kabaddi and cricket, two were army personnel and one was a police constable. The mechanism of injury in 52% of the cases was RTAs and 20% sports injuries. 25 patients had associated meniscal injuries, which were treated with partial meniscectomy and meniscal balancing. We could conclude a statistically significant improvement in the Lisholm knee score with a pre-op score averaging at 60.2 and a one-year follow-up score at 96.7. Only two patients had a one-plus laxity, but they were asymptomatic. This could be uh, because of soft tissue graft use. Four patients had a less than one centimeter thigh wasting and one patient had a two centimeter thigh wasting. The other patients didn't have any significant thigh wasting. We could conclude no statistically significant difference in the ankle hind foot score. Eversion strength was slightly decreased in three patients with a four plus power and one with a four by five power. First ray plantar flexion strength was decreased in one patient with a four plus by five power and one with a four by five power. Two patients experienced complications in the form of a superficial tibial tunnel infection which responded well to oral antibiotics and one patient had knee stiffness who was treated with rigorous physiotherapy. So you'll ask me, why did we choose the peroneus longus tendon? The peroneus longus is superficially located in the lateral leg compartment. This makes it quick, easy and safe to expose and harvest. The peroneus longus and the peroneus brevis have a synergistic action. Otis et al. in 2004 concluded in their study that the peroneus brevis was in fact the more effective everter when compared with the peroneus longus. By doing tenodesis of the distal peroneal longus stump to the peroneus brevis, we aimed to maintain the tension and hence the length in the remnant tendon and preserve the synergistic function of the peroneus longus and the brevis, thus grossly preserving foot eversion and first ray plantar flexion strength post-harvest. Then why not the hamstrings, you ask? The concern was thigh wasting in a lot of the cases. Secondly, the hamstrings act as pro-ACL muscles, protecting the reconstructed ACL from anterior draw forces. The medial hamstrings act as internal rotators of the tibia. This movement is important in sports persons. There is some concern regarding injury to the infrapatella branch of the saphenous nerve when harvesting the hamstrings and the hamstrings produces a non-cosmetic scar anteriorly over the knee. Retome et al. in 2019 conducted a study and they recommended the peroneus longus as a superior graft when compared to the hamstrings with the advantage of a larger graft diameter, less thigh hypertrophy and excellent ankle function. They also conducted another study to assess the eversion and first ray plantar flexion strength when using the peroneus longus and concluded no muscle strength deterioration during eversion and first ray plantar flexion and no donor site morbidity at the harvest site. He et al. in 2020 conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing the peroneus longus with the hamstrings when used for ACL reconstruction. They found comparable functional outcome and graph survival rates they found a slight decrease in the ankle hind foot score. However, the patients were not functionally limited. They recommended the peroneus longus as a suitable autograft harvested outside the knee, which avoids the complication of quadriceps hamstrings imbalance 
which occurs when harvesting autographs around the knee. No study is perfect, neither was mine. It had a few limitations, being a single center study with a small sample size, a short follow-up of one year, and the use of subjective scores for assessment of outcome. In conclusion, my study had encouraging results with a good functional outcome, minimal donor site morbidity, less thigh wasting, better cosmesis, and an added advantage of preserving the hamstrings, which act as pro-ACL muscles. I would recommend the Peronius longus as a promising primary autograft. We aim to continue this study and follow up the patients for a longer period of time and hope that in the future we are able to do a multicentric study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sasha. Questions? Hello. So, my yes, question sir. to the uh, speaker who just spoke about the Peronius longus. Yes, what kind of ankle uh, stability score testing was done, especially in the runners? Because I feel peroneus longus is the most important muscle when you think about using it for a primary ACL reconstruction instead of doing it in multi-ligament reconstruction. Correct. So what exactly was tested when you did it in the sprinters, runners, long runners and army personals? Uh, sir, uh, we were uh, very lucky that we did not have any patient who presented with us with an ankle instability already. We had decided to screen patients and not include them in our study if they had an ankle uh, instability prior to gr harvesting the graft. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, I'm, Dr. I'm Dr. Sanjay from my uh, NHS Ashwini. My question is, when you do the tenodesis, here, uh, when you do the tenodesis, uh, what is the position of the foot? Like it's in slight inversion, neutral or uh, full inversion when you do the tenodesis of uh, remnant to the per peroneus brevis? Sir, either neutral or in slight inversion, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. Jayesh Shah. Excuse me. Number one, this side. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the size in terms of the length and the diameter of the donor before and after preparation for the graft? Um, so we were able to get uh, between 9 and 11 by uh, doubling the, most of the times we doubled the uh, harvested graft and we were able to get a diameter between 9 and 11. So, so yes, if sir. after uh, taking peroneus tendon, longest tendon, yes, sir. there is no disability even in runner, military person. Yes, sir. I want to know if there is traumatic transaction, there is no need of suturing it. Uh, sorry, sir, please could you repeat your question? So, okay. if there is no disability after taking graft of peroneus longus tendon, yes, sir. and there is no disability in runner and military person, as you have tested, if there is transaction, traumatic cut of peroneus tendon, there is no need of doing suturing. Sir, we actually, uh, we wanted to preserve the eversion strength, which, and peroneus brevis was more active as an everter, but peroneus longus does have some effect in eversion. So, we didn't want any decrease in the strength is why we went for tenodesis, sir. Yeah, thank you, Shasha. Thank you, sir. I would request again, instead of comments, just ask a brief question so that more people can ask. Thank you. So we call upon the next speaker. Yeah. Call upon Dr. Darshan Mahesh Kapoor for his paper. Regeneration of Tendo Achilles following complete tenotomy in club feet treated by Ponsethi's method in children older than one year, a clinical and sonographic case series. Dr. Darshan. Good morning. Hello. Yeah. Good morning, respected chairperson, respected judges, seniors, and dear colleagues. I thank Vairoc for this opportunity and acknowledge my co-authors for this opportunity to present our research, which is the regeneration of tendo Achilles following complete tenotomy in the walking age clubfoot children. 
This study was conducted at Wadia Children's Hospital in Mumbai. The Ponseti method is a standard of care for the treatment of club foot since early 2000s. Recent evidence suggests that it can be successfully used with high success rates even in the older children as supported by our own article. The tenotomy of the tendo Achilles is an integral part of the Ponseti method. However, due to limited evidence, there are no clear guidelines regarding the techniques required when the tenotomy is performed in the older age group. There is no doubt about the healing of the tendo Achilles when it is performed in the infant age group. But does the tendo Achilles regenerate completely when it is performed in the older child? To answer this question, we conducted this study to understand the regeneration of Achilles tendon using sonography and clinical outcomes in children in whom tenotomy was performed above the age of one year. The Ponseti method was adopted as a standard of care since 2003 and a dedicated club foot clinic was started in our hospital since 2011. The prospectively collected data was gathered on a standardized approved pro forma through the International Club Foot Registry. This study is a retrospective analysis of the idiopathic club foot children above the age of one year who underwent tenotomy as a part of the Ponseti method from 2011 to 2020. Serial weekly casts were applied in the outpatient department followed by a percutaneous complete tenotomy performed by a 15 number surgical blade under general anesthesia in the operation theatre. A complete tenotomy was confirmed with a sudden pop, increased dorsiflexion and a palpable gap clinically. If adequate dorsiflexion was not achieved, serial weekly casts were applied later till 15 degrees of it was obtained. The treatment was provided by pediatric orthopedic fellows. A sample of 20 children, 31 club feet, who met the following inclusion-exclusion criteria were contacted telephonically and evaluated at their last follow-up, minimum of six months. They were evaluated using the clinical, functional, and the ultrasonographic parameters on a single sitting. The clinical assessment included the ankle active range of motion with the child placed in supine position and the knee extended using a handheld goniometer. The tendo Achilles power was measured using MR cigarettes. The functional evaluation and the endurance testing of the tendo Achilles was carried out by a validated heel raise test. In this, the child was asked to stand against a wall and the heel raise was asked to perform every two seconds with a target of 30 heel raises per minute. The test is terminated and the number of heel raise per minute is noted. If the child stops performing or is not able to maintain the frequency or is not able to do it properly. The highest height achieved during the entire test duration is the height of the heel raise, which was measured using a smartphone camera placed on the floor level. The, the sonographic parameters was used because it non-invasively demonstrates anatomical continuity. A single senior sonologist performed all the scanning with more than 15 years of experience in the pediatric musculoskeletal scanning. It was done using a hockey stick probe with the patient in prone position at the level of scar mark and it was done in the axial and longitudinal planes. The entire Achilles tendon was scanned from proximal muscular tendinous junction all the way distally up to the insertion and any thickening, fibrosis or scarring was noted. The quantitative parameters include the tendon width and thickness measured in centimeters and the qualitative parameters were a dynamic continuity and a echo texture of the tendon. Moving on to the results, of the 31 feet in our study, 11 cases were bilateral and 9 were unilateral where the opposite side served as control. The mean age of tenotomy performed was at 2.6 years. The mean age at final assessment was 7.7 .7 years with the youngest, youngest child assessed at 4 years of age and the oldest at 11 years of age. The mean age at follow-up, the follow-up period was 5.2 years. All Tendo Achilles power measured was MRC grade 5. The number of heel raise per minute was 24 per minute and the height was 6 centimeters. The ankle dorsiflexion measured was slightly lower at a mean of 16 degrees with a range of 10 to 25. The ankle plantar flexion was a mean of 43 degrees. All tendons showed intact dynamic continuity on scanning and the hallmark of healing was a homogeneous echo texture which was noted in all cases except for one patient who had heterogeneous echo texture on the tenor, uh, scanning but an intact clinical and functional outcome. There was no significant difference in the tendon dimensions on comparing on both the sides in bilateral cases. However, 
on comparing the tendon dimensions in unilateral cases where the opposite side foot served as control, there was slight reduction in the tendon width. This is a case example of 11 year old girl with bilateral club foot where the tenotomy was performed at three years of age. At seven years follow-up, she had good recovery of the clinical and functional outcome and a homogeneous echo texture and a comparable tendon dimensions on the scanning. On reviewing the literature, there have been few studies looking at the regeneration of tendo Achilles after tenotomy with a supporting clinical and or imaging parameters in the form of sonography or a MRI scan. However, in all these cases, the tenotomy was performed in less than one year of age. There was one study by Matthew et al, which was studied in older age group children, but they evaluated only clinical parameters. In contrast to all these studies, our study is unique where a clinical as well as sonographic parameters was combined used and the tenotomy was performed above the age of one year. As per our knowledge, ours is the first study to conclusively prove that tendoachilles regenerates completely after a percutaneous tenotomy in the walking age clubfoot child. At mean follow-up of five years, adequate dorsiflexion was achieved and a normal tendoachilles power was measured without any functional restriction. Intact dynamic continuity of the tendoachilles was confirmed on sonography and with a homogeneous echo texture and almost normal tendon thickness and width as compared to the opposite side. Limitation of our study was it was a sample which was smaller at a single center and the subjectivity of the sonography as a method of evaluation. Did we find answers to the question with which we began our study? Ladies and gentlemen, we firmly conclude that the tendo Achilles, the strongest tendon in the body, unites completely after a tenotomy in clubfoot cases above the age of one year as proven by the clinical, functional and sonographic parameters. I thank you all for the attention listening. Yes, Dr. Molin. Darshan, that was a great paper. Thank you, sir. Based on this study, uh, till what age you would recommend a complete TA tenotomy? That's the first question. And the second one, you please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a nice question. Uh, so in our study, the highest tenotomy which was performed was at 6.5 years. We have a similar paper of the treatment in done in the walking age group where the highest age recommended was up to 10 years. The next question is what you do if after tenotomy your correction is not full? Do you keep on doing casting or? Yes, that's what was uh, just showed there. So with serial weekly casting were adequated that was performed in the outpatient department weekly till 15 degrees of it was achieved. Thank you, Molin. Yeah, next question you can ask, sir. Yes, hello. Kindly introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Roshan. Uh, I want to ask this uh, uh, speaker. Roshan, Roshan, let's give somebody else a chance. He's here since before you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's yes. a nice paper. I'm Dr. Tosif. Uh, Darshan, we have three probes uh, in ultrasound, curvilinear probe, linear probe, and the hockey stick probe, you, what you have shown. Yes, yes. So, uh, like, what is advantage of using a hockey stick probe over all these uh, two probes? So, the hockey stick probe is the one which has higher frequency, and it was the one which has a better resolution of the superficial imaging. And it is much smaller and easier to hold. So, on... Uh, when we do the scanning in the children, it is much better with respect to the resolution and more dependent is the more uh, subjectivity and the thickening. Thickening and the measurements of the sonography is better performed. Uh, my question to the speaker is about the ten type of tenotomy. Uh, do you do a complete tenotomy with the tendon sheath or you do uh, intra-tendinous tenotomy? Because that is going to decide the outcome of your uh, tenotomy healing, especially in children and then little on. Uh, the older age group. So, do you do a complete transaction of the tendon along with the tendon sheet or you do an intratendinous tenotomy? Sir, in all cases, the tenotomy was performed by percutaneous method and only the, till the complete tenotomy was performed, which is confirmed by the three points, that is the palpable pop, increased dorsiflexion and the palpable glap clinically. So, that is the confirmation that the entire tenotomy, the, it was complete. Thank you, Darshan. Please Thank come you, and collect your certificate.
So we call the next speaker uh, Pallav Praful Agarwal. He is going to speak on analysis of proximal femoral lengthening for post-traumatic reconstruction. Respected chairpersons, teachers and friends, I'll be speaking on analysis of proximal femoral lengthening in post-trauma reconstruction. Uh, difficult femur non-unions can present with infection, deformities, bone gaps and shortenings. There is a lot of literature, experience and progress with modern uh, methods to achieve, achieve uh, union at the non-union site. But there is very little literature that addresses the problem of shortening associated with distal femur non-unions. So the true shortening is the bone gap plus the external shortening revealed by full length or full segment x-rays. So a question arises, is proximal lending possible safely and simultaneously with the treatment of difficult or infected middle third and lower third non-unions? And how does the proximal regenerate behave while lending? We studied 115 proximal femoral lending in such cases. We studied these four parameters and focused on angulation at the regenerate bone. We tried to find the correlation of angulation with general pin-related, osteotomy-related and non-union-related parameters. In our study, 16 were female. The mean age was 36 years, ranging from 10 to 65 years. This was the laterality. Most were in the lower third of the femur. The mean preoperative shortening was 84 millimeters, ranging from 24 to 270 millimeters. Half of them were infected. Either three or four pins were used depending on the type of external fixator applied. A hash configuration with two pins going up the neck and two coming down the trochanter were used in 68 patients with Elizar and a parallel configuration in 47 with LRS. An oblique osteotomy to increase the regenerate area and possibly prevent varus angulation was done in 23. 56 were commutated, 26 were oblique, and 28 unions had a transverse bony ends. The distance of osteotomy was measured from the base of the lesser trochanter and classified into two groups of less than and more than 30 millimeters. A standard operative technique was used to fix the femur with an Elizar or an LRS in all our cases. A percutaneous uh, osteotomy was done using drill holes and 6 to 10 millimeters of osteotomes in all our patients. So this ensured minimum damage to the periosteum and no gap or translation at the osteotomy site. So when 3 out of the 4 cortices in AP and lateral and 5 out of the 8 cortices in AP, lateral and oblique x-rays were mature, we took it at the lending duration though the fixator came out only once the non-union healed. Uh, this paper does not focus on non-union management and we measured the angular deformity only in coronal plane as it was difficult to take true lateral x-rays in proximal femur region in many patients. So a case of LRS assisted lending was done in a case of uh, infected non-union after thorough debridement and antibiotic cement block. A length of 92 millimeters was achieved at the lending site Infection was eradicated, non-union was achieved with minimum residual shortening and angulation and this uh, and le leading to a mild mechanical axis deviation. We achieved a mean lending of 64 millimeters ranging from 14 to 180 millimeters. Equal limb lengths were seen in 14% of our patients with a mean residual shortening of 23 millimeters in the rest. The lending index is a subjective measurement of time taken for complete consolidation of the region rate sufficient for the fixator to be removed theoretically. External fixator index is the overall duration till the external fixator removal and is influenced by the excess time taken up by the non-union to heal. Uh, hence, this reflects the relative ease and speed of the lending of new region generate bone proximally and the difficulty of the non-union healing. Another method was regenerate mat uh, maturity was also determined by measuring the width and pixel value ratio to decide the hardening of the regenerate using image J software. Complications. So, this neurologist had five failed previous surgeries with persistent infection and oblique non-union with mild shortening. The regenerate went into a premature consolidation at 24 millimeters and he refused a repeat osteotomy. TSF helped achieved uh, horizontal compression at the non-union site. He healed well with very little delta MED. The small shortening reflects some loss of length by compression at the non-union site. Around 20% of our patients had premature consolidation, some needing repeated corticotomy, uh, which shows that there was exuberant bone formation. Repeated osteotomy was done multiple times, maybe once, twice, or even thrice. Causes. As there is simultaneous turnings at multiple connections at the two sites at different rates, some patients were confused and did imp improper turning. Non-parallelism of the distraction mechanism was one of the other causes. Inadequate medial distraction also leads to premature consolidation. 
we equalize the distraction by converting the 120 degree arc to a 360 degree uniform distraction and adding an empty ring to the construct. Over distraction which can cause a poor regenerate, as in this case infected non-union with a 10 centimeter shortening, the patient wrongly over distracted 70 millimeters in 30 days. As a result, bone formation was deficient. We did accordion maneuver with bone marrow injection at the lending site. It took around seven months for the regenerate to unite. So the commonest complication was a virus deformity. 66 had excellent results. Only 25 had a deformity greater than 15 degrees. Only age and weight correlated moderately with the angular deformities. All other parameters like distance from, like pro, number of proximal pins, shape of the non-union, pins configurations, distance from the lesser trochanter, total lending achieved, and osteostomy shape had weak correlation. One of the causes of varus angulation at the region rate was a distal deformity. A case with, varus, with a varus non-union at the femur with a valgus malunion at the tibia, we did proximal femur lending and saw that the region rate was going into varus. We observed that any deformity distally will automatically angulate the soft region rate. So in this case, the region rate automatically corrected as the distal deformity was gradually aligned. Pin loosening was seen in 24 of our patients and had to be revised as a minor procedure. The pressure of the bed in the posterior part of the arc tend to cause the proximal pin loosening. Hence, we use a cut mattress in all our indoor patients and ask them to use it at home also. Out of uh, the 115, 109 united, we used augmentation with bone marrow injection in 39, autologous bone grafts in some because most patients had exhausted bone graft sites and some refused. I would like to wind up with an interesting case. Uh, a young IIT engineer with a huge femoral bone loss who wanted equal limb lengths and knee range of movement treated innovatively by a, primary, by, by a primary orthopedic surgeon with a custom processes to maintain the length. We started lending with extra long LRS rail and a distal Elizarov. The task given to us was to give him a complete length for a future total knee replacement. We gave him the biggest length of our study with a residual limb length of 22 millimeters. He is now awaiting for an orthoplasty surgeon to take up his case. Perhaps ours is the largest uh, series of proximal femur lending in post-traumatic reconstruction. I would like to conclude that look for and simultaneously treat shortening in distal non-unions. Premature consolidation is common due to good bone formation. Look for and treat virus deformity in older heavy patients. Persistent virus may not dramatically alter the mechanical axis compared to the opposite side. Greater efforts are needed to speed up healing at the difficult non-unions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Swapnil. I want to know what is the indication of oblique proximal femoral osteotomy in your study and what are the advantage and disadvantage of that? Sir, the only disadvantage of, of uh, ob oblique osteotomy was, sir, uh, it, it, it was more difficult to do due, due to the placement uh, in the lateral view, it was not very clear. The, the uh, straight osteotomy took a le lesser time, the transverse osteo osteotomy took a le lesser time. I want to ask you one question here. Hello. Dr. Karkanis. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, what are the range of movements of the knee that you got because of so many pins going through the quadriceps and the patient having a non-union start with? Sir, uh, thank you for the question, sir. Around 80% of, uh, of, of our patients came with already a very stiff knee due to multiple surgeries, prolonged immobilization, and uh, more than 80% of our patients had a knee range of movement of less than 30 and around 40% had no range of movements. And we did a few uh, quadriceps plasty, but uh, the knee range of movement was still restricted in all our patients. I have a question. Uh, uh, so, how many did you use Elizaro and how many did you use LRS? Sir, uh, 68. 68 were Elizaro, sir. And have you shifted more of them to LRS in recent times? Sir, actually, we had to shift a few patients of LRS to Elizaro because it went into a virus, uh, a virus uh, angulation. And what was the average number of surgeries one patient had to undergo? Sir, the uh, pre-operatively, sir, the average number of sur surgeries was around six. And post-operatively, sir, only in 15 patients, we had to convert the LRS to an Elizaro. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's collect your certificate.
so we invite uh, the next speaker comparison of lengthening over nails versus lengthening with external fixators again from the same institute ishani milin choudhary yes ishani go ahead chairman sirs esteemed audience and friends i'll be comparing lengthening over nails lon and lengthening with external fixation Limb lengthening is needed in congenital, developmental, and post-traumatic infective and neoplastic sequelae. The LRS, Ilizaro, and Hexapod fixators are routinely used for limb lengthening. Lengthening over a nail was described by Paley in 1997, after which it has been routinely used. But there is not much literature that compares these two techniques. We aim to compare LON with that with fixators. Our study consisted of 111 segments of LON compared to 115 segments with external fixation. The mean age of LON group was older at about 26 and of LEF was pre around adolescence. We used the Ilizaro fixator in 28 femora and 65 tibia, the LRS for only femurs and TSF saw the least use. 61 tibia had the standard tibia trauma nail special straight nails were used in 39 femora and humerus nails in four femurs and eight tibia as described by gordon lef was done by the standard method lon required special but affordable instruments like the straight nail the rigid reamer polar screws and accurate planning which was done with the help of full length x rays full segment x rays in ap and lateral and the magnification markers which helped to choose the nail with the proper length and diameter The access viability of the entry point was important. The LON procedure: external fixator pins inserted, reaming done, nail inserted up to the planned osteotomy site, osteotomy done, nail inserted further and locked only proximally, kept free distally to let sliding and lengthening. External fixator removed and nail locked distally after length is achieved. Note that the external fixation pins were posterior to the nail. Now, LON was indicated in non-infective cases, in roomy patent canals, accessible entry points, and usually after skeletal maturity. Illustrating some cases. Now, in this case, LON could not be done in the femur because the canal was narrow and sclerotic, and hence LEF was chosen. In this case, proximal entry for the LON was not possible due to severe coxa valga, and distal entry was not possible due to patella baja, so the LEF was done. LEF LON was mostly done after skeletal maturity in four pre-adolescent patients we have used the humerus nail through a trochanteric entry as described by gordon we analyze the outcomes based on the length gain percentage lengthening external fixation duration in days and index as days per centimeter we calculated the level of difficulty score as given by paley and noted the complications this was a retrospective level 3b study and the two groups were matched for the level of difficulty score We found that mean length gain was similar in both methods. Percentage lengthening was significantly more in the LEF group. For the same amount of lengthening, external fixation duration and index was half in LON, and this was statistically significant. The level of difficulty score was similar, and the groups were comparable. Match comparing the nuances of LON and LEF through cases. This 22, this two-year-old child post septic bone gap of four centimeters and external shortening of six centimeters. had a fibular graft to fill the distal defect and proximal corticotomy with the ilizaro was done the defect filled well the length was achieved within 6 months this highlights the utility of the ilizaro fixator in complex cases like bone gaps where no other fixators especially at his young age would have worked for the 16 year old girl with 3 cm shortening and valgus in the femur the valgus was corrected acutely using rule 2 of deformity correction and lengthening was done gradually the lon enabled early fixator removal in just 1.5 months but in contrast for the similar shortening and deformity lef took much longer to gradually collect, correct and lengthen through the same site in this femoral overriding malunion with 4.5 cm shortening leading to lon he achieved target length in just 2.5 months with full knee flexion in 3 months post fixator removal in a case with similar discrepancy where lon could not be done he got lef but it took double the time and post the fixator removal his knee range of motion was only 70 degrees a case of double femoral and single tibial lef done in the same patient with a large discrepancy the severe tibial deformity with a, as a sequela of compartment syndrome 
five centimeter length was achieved very fast with the LO in the, in the undeformed femur, and he was free from the fixator soon, but the tibial lengthening happened gradually along with the deformity correction. A case of double femoral and single tibial LEF done in the same patient with Olier's disease, dysplastic bone, large shortening, as well as large multiple deformities. The LEF was the only option in such cases. Over 15 months, he gained the lengthening and deformity correction amounting to 19, 19 centimeters, and repeat lengthening was done again with LEF after two years. We noted the complications, deep IM infections, premature consolidation, axial deviation. While superficial pin track infections are commonly known, deep IM infections were noted in LON, but LON prevented severe axial deviations. The other complications of LON like nail break and loss of fixation were treated by converting to LEF. The solution for the deep IM infection is remove the nail, ream, debride, maintain or add external fixation, insert an ABC rod, add antibiotics as per culture. All the infections were resolved. One had a sequela of knee stiffness. When premature consolidation occurred, we solved it by extracting the nail partially, repeat the corticotomy, reinsert the nail, and lock the nail distally. And the lengthenings continued. In one case, we needed to convert the LON to LEF, and in some cases, the patients refused a repeat, repeat corticotomy, and the length fell short. The obstacle of knee stiffness, as in this patient, was solved by cordyceps plasty and arthrolysis. This was usually done six months to one year after the fixator removal. Coming to the discussion, literature review showed that the other studies mostly had single segments and far lesser numbers. Only in one study by Sun et al, it was more segments, but they were all cosmetic lengthenings and only in the tibia, so their level of difficulty was less. The strength of our study was the large numbers, the comparison, both used in the tibia as well as the femur, and the com high complexity of the cases. The limitation that the group was not matched by age and etiology. Analyzing our large series, we found that LEF is versatile, can be used in all ages, causes, segments, deformities, and can correct complications of LON. But LON is convenient for the patient as compared to LEF, and extremely cost-effective, almost 50 times so, as compared to advanced internal lengthening nails. LON efficiently cor corrects wide range of shortening and deformities, as in this case of a radiologist with fibrous dysplasia who had shortening of 12.5 centimeters, double level deformity correction was done with the LON, and he achieved target length as well. In conclusion, both LON and LEF are effective for lengthening and deformity correction, but lengthening over nails significantly reduces the external fixation time, helps with faster knee range of motion recovery, and is very convenient for the patient. But LEF has universal applications and can solve most complications of LON. Paying homage to Dr. K.S. Masalawala's memory, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Ishani. Uh, any questions? Yes, Dr. Muki. the real originator, Heisenberg or Pelle? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, regarding the level of difficulty, it was mentioned by both the authors, um, originator of the technique. Yeah. Um, doc, I mean, we've referenced it from Dr. Paley's paper, and the, so would go with that. Is the Heisenberg who was doing it first. Thank you, sir. So if today you have to do this procedure, which will, will you prefer? Sir, I would prefer lengthening over nails, um, provided that after proper analysis, the indication for the LON is there with the, with the analysis of the deformity. Okay. Thank you for the question, sir. There is one more question, Dr. Rajveer Chennai. Just a, sm just a small comment, compliments to Milind on two papers from one institution. Thank you, sir. Ishani, please come and collect your certificate. Thank you. We call up, yeah, we call upon the last speaker of the Masalawala session, uh, Dr. Ashish Patak.
He is going to talk on alignment and total knee replacement when distal femoral cut is taken as planned on long leg standing radiographs. A study of 115 patients. Please start the timer. Can I start? Yes, you can start. Alignment in the total knee orthoplasty when the distal femur cut is taken as planned on the long leg standing radiograph, a study of 115 patients. Mechanical alignment was first described by John Insull, which leads to the equal loading in the medial and the lateral surface. Acceptable alignment is 180 degree plus or minus 3 degree due to the constitutional <coughs> virus present in the general population. Outliers more than 3 degree virus or valgus will require uh, will lead to implant failures and implant loosening. So in conventional TPR, uh, TKR, the tibial mechanical and <coughs> sorry, uh, tibial mechanical anatomical axis are the same. Hence the extramedullary jig gives the predictable outcome. While in the fe uh, di femur, distal valgus cut is taken with the help of intramedullary jig with a ang valgus correction angle. This ang uh, as in the femur, because this difference between the femoral uh, mechanical and anatomical axis, ideally this v uh, valgus correction angle should equal to this difference between this <coughs> femur's anatomical and mechanical axis or the pharma. The pharma is not a constant, it is a very uh, vari wide variations are observed and <coughs> sorry, factors affecting to the pharma or the coxa. Thank you, sir. <coughs> factors affecting are the coxa vera valga, femoral bowing and severe deformity. In our study, we have done the preoperatively measurement of the pharma on the long length standing hip to ankle <coughs> radiograph of both lo lower limb. Intraoperatively distal femur cut was taken variable depending on the preoperative pharma. Radiological assessment was done in the uh, after three months with a scanogram and functional recovery up to 12 years with OKs and KSS. So we have included uh, only primary uh, uh, TKR with the patient of arthritis with varus deformity. The uh, patient having fixed flexion deformity more than 15 degree and January curvatum were excluded from the study. A constant technique of taking the scanogram is very important where the fixed distance is uh, followed and the neutral alignment, uh, neutral rotation of the limb is important. It has been co <coughs> confirmed with the, when the maximum knee uh, extended, both feet are parallel and patellized facing forward. And the uh, scanogram has to be evaluated on the, uh, for the correct alignment with the half of the lesser trochanter is uh, <coughs> seen on the medial half of the fibular head should overlap with the tibial metaphysis. In the knee, the rotation is uh, correct, then it will form patella is a center with a dome shape, well if it is uh, rotation is not correct, then the patella is eccentric with a triangular shape. So once the scanogram is <laughs> obtained, we do the, some measurement. First we do uh, the center of the femur head by marking the uh, circle, <coughs> appropriate circle with the packs. Distal femur uh, midpoint is marked with this uh, mid <coughs> medial edge of the femoral notch from where the femoral jig entry is to be taken. And then we measure the lower limb alignment, this uh, femoral anatomical and mechanical axis difference. All surgeries were performed by single surgeon with a medial parapetalar approach. In surgical technique, the tibia extramedullary chip is used with the three-step technique, applying it to the fixed uh, anatomical landmark, proximally and distally, check the jig uh, parallel to the jig, and uh, correct the <coughs> check the alignment after the TBL cut also. The femoral entry is important and it is taken one centimeter above and two millimeters medial on the white side line. O important is to over drill the femoral entry 
In our case, we have taken <coughs> eight millimeter rods with the 12 millimeters of over drilling. Follow up after uh, 12 months, three months, we have done the scanogram and we have observed that in 115 patients, in one, 155 needs, 29 male and 86 female with average age 67 and 68 respectively. We have found that pharma is varied from five, <coughs> uh, uh, there is variability of the pharma with the minimum 4.2 to maximum 6.7 percent with an average of six. Where the majority was found between five to six percent, six to seven degrees of pharma uh, we have found in th 35 percentage of uh, patient. Below five uh, degrees we have found in 13 percent patient and above seven uh, the, uh, there was in almost 16 percent <coughs> patient. While uh, comparing the distribution with the neck shaft angle and the femoral bowing with the pharma variation, the neck shaft angle has a significant correlation more than the femoral bowing. Coming to the intraop uh, distribution of this valgus <laughs> correction angle, we have taken maximum angle, uh, maximum number of uh, percentage was at the five degree. Next, we use the uh, six degree. But above seven degree was required in almost 26% of the cases and less than five is used in almost 3% of the cases. Coming to the pre-op <coughs> and post-op limb alignment. Coming to the post-op and pre-op limb alignment, preoperatively average virus was 19 degree where the maximum cases was below 15 degree. Post-operatively, the um, average virus uh, we, <coughs> average uh, virus noted was almost 2.1 point <laughs> 9 degree and uh, more than 3 degree was observed in a, uh, th three cases functional outcome the preoperatively this oxford knee score and uh, <coughs> has the and knee society score uh, the uh, difference is statistically significant there is a wide distribution of this uh, uh, femoral anatomical and mechanical axis in arthritic population uh, ranging from 2 to 9 percent. Various factors are there, <coughs> neck shaft angle affect. In our study, the variability was from 4 to 7, 8 degree and 29 percent values were less than 5 and above 7 degrees. Fixed uh, 6 degree valgus cut has shown acceptable result up to 86 percent. Also, the meta-analysis of the individualized VCA shows the predictable <coughs> improved outcome with the variable VCA. So in our study, we have achieved the acceptable alignment in 97% of the cases, the 3% mal alignment we have found, or the outliers were due to the virus mal alignment. Short term functional outcome shows good result. And our study is a short term study with a small numbers. So we recommended that all primary uh, TKR should be evaluated with the long length standing X-rays preoperatively to find out pharma and take a variable <coughs> cut intraoperatively <coughs> depending on the pre of pharma. Question. Yes. Did your study have any difference in the patient reported outcomes? Uh, Did it make any difference in the patient reported outcomes? Functional outcomes, sir. Yes. yes. Patient reported outcomes, not functional outcomes. Uh, so patient is happy, unhappy, depending no, on sir, what. We haven't uh, studied that patient reported outcome. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions, kindly come and collect your certificate, please. So with this we conclude our session.